Radio. Good morning, Willow. Good morning. Are y'all ready to worship? Yeah. All right. So in our little prayer circle we do every morning, um, someone was talking about how just important this song is and how important the words are and how, you know, he's experienced it in his own life and how disbelief, you know, we don't have to feel guilty for disbelief, right? But the moment we start singing this song, what rises up is belief. And so as we sing this song, I want y'all to sing this song, like with everything that you are. If you have something that you're struggling with, I want you to sing this song to that. If you have something that you're grieving over, I want you to sing this song to that, like, God, I believe, and I'm gonna raise a hallelujah no matter where I am, and no matter what is going on around me, the hallelujah will be raised to you. So y'all stand up and let's do this together. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me.
mountain can't be moved They say these chains will never break But they don't know you like we do There is power in your name We've heard that there is no In the darkness we were waiting Without hope, without light So from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt Yeah.
always faithful, always with us. That's who he is. But I'm wondering this morning if it's a little hard for you to sing this. Or if it's easy to sing it, but the second the song is over, those thoughts come back of like, yeah, but God, where were you here? Where were you there? This thing that happened to me, where were you then? I think this morning the Lord is wanting us to let go of the expectations that we have of him. See, we have expectations of what goodness looks like. We have expectations of what God's justice looks like. We have expectations of what his faithfulness looks like. And we can't understand everything. And as people that we want to understand, like we're wired to want to understand, and when we don't understand, we begin to fill in the blanks with, with what we think could be why. And I think we need to learn how to live in that mystery of like, God, I don't know why I didn't feel you there. I don't know why for this entire season you didn't seem to be speaking to me. I don't know why this didn't work out for me. I don't know why that relationship went south for me. I don't know why my family isn't speaking to me anymore. I don't know why, like there's all these things, right? And this morning I feel like, like when we were sitting there in worship, I just saw hands tightly closed around expectations and then they were open and free. See, it is in our weakness that we are strong, right? That is scripture. That is purely the word of God. In our weakness, we are strong. But when we are trying so hard to be strong that we cannot be weak, we get in our own way. And I feel like this morning, God's like, I want you to surrender. I want you to surrender your expectations of what I look like, of what me working looks like. And I want you to stop trying to take control of that. And I want you to let it go. We don't always understand. And that can be really hard in the moment. But when we put our eyes on Jesus and everything comes into perspective, when we go up higher with him and we begin to pray over those situations and we begin to see them differently, things change, but it's really hard to do both of those whenever our fists are so tight around what we thought we deserved, around how we thought something would go. And hear me, some of those things, they shouldn't have happened. Some of those relationships, they should not have been cut off. Some of those things, you did everything perfectly right. And yet, it didn't go the way you thought. So if that's you in any way, I just want you to put your hands in front of you. I want you to close your fists. And I want you to just have a moment with the Lord. And just release those expectations to him. Release yourself from those expectations of you. Release other people from the expectations you had of them. So Father God, this morning, would you blow through this house? As we open our hands and release the things that we thought should be a certain way, would you just blow those away? Father, I'm thankful that all you ask of us is our obedience. All you ask of us is our obedience. You are a relational God. You just want connection and love. So 
So no matter what the outcome, no matter what that person's response, no matter, it, our job, our job is to love you, to love others, to obey. So we just thank you, Father God, that that's all that you have for us. Those are the things that you want from us. So God, would you release us from the pressure of having to do things a certain way, things having to look a certain way, having to act a certain way, and just being able to rest in you? I just feel like the Lord is saying that those things that we're holding on to, it's like they're chained to the earth. And once we let them go, we can go up higher with him. So Father, this morning we let go of those things that we've been holding on to so that we can come up higher with you. Your word says that, that we are seated with you in heavenly places. So this morning, God, we choose to take our seat with you, to let go of the things of the world, to let go of the, the things that we think we have to control in order to be with you, to spend time with you, to come up higher with you. God, I pray that you would just seal that reality in our hearts that that in our weakness that we are strong. In our weakness we are strong. And we thank you for who you are and that God. It's because of you that that reality is true. It's because of you that we don't have to live up to the standards of the world. It's because of you that we don't have to, to do all the things like the world says that we have to do. Our good ideas don't have to be their good ideas. The way they do life doesn't have to be the way we do life because of you. So Father, we let go of all of that this morning and we surrender and we lay our lives down for you, for you, for more of you. And we choose to come up higher with you this morning to rejoice in the fact that you have been faithful even when we didn't understand what it looked like and that you have always been speaking even when there have been seasons of silence. That you have always been for us even in our low moments where we feel like we had done a bad job, when we had put ourselves in that situation. God, you are always for us. You have never left our side. You are a good God full of strength and holiness and righteousness and justice and love for your people. So Father, we let go of all the things of the world and we choose to embrace that, who you are, your heavenly reality. So church, as we go back into this song, let's sing it from a new place. And if it doesn't hit quite right, bring that to the Lord, take it to him. He wants to bring truth to that area. Let's sing together.
Did you leave us on our own? Cause you are faithful, God. You are faithful. And every step we are breathing in your grace. Now evermore we'll be breathing out your praise. Cause you are faithful, God. You are faithful. Yes, you are faithful, God. You are faithful. Yes, you are faithful, God. You are faithful. Good morning. Y'all can be seated. Uh, as we see on the screen, there's the ways that you can give and we encourage y'all to, to please want to use one of those ways and uh, worship the Lord this morning. Uh, Halissa, I, I, it's just so neat how God, and I think this brings uh, the scripture that I was going to read this morning, listen to the last part of this. It says This comes from he Hebrews 3. It says, Be careful then, brother, dear brothers and sisters. Make sure that your own hearts are not evil and unbelieving, turning you away from the living God. You must warn each other every day while it, while it is still today. Today. Not tomorrow, not the next day, not next week, today. So that none of you will be deceived by sin and hardened against God. For if we are fear, faithful till the end, trusting God as firmly as we, when we first believed, we will share in all that belongs to Christ. Remember what it says today, when you hear His voice, don't harden your hearts as Israel did and rebelled. And so same thing it's like don't turn your heart you know we sometimes can put things in the way there life is messy and we we can put all kind of barriers that stops this stops us from hearing the Lord stops us from fully experiencing everything that he has for us so I encourage you just to open your hearts today hear his word let him speak to you and and it, I, it just get all those things out of the way let's go to the Lord Dear Father, Lord, we just love you. We thank you. Lord, you are faithful. And we just pray, Lord, that you would open up our hearts today. Help us to hear you. Help us to, to respond, Father, to your word, to respond to the movement of your spirit, Father. Speak to us this morning. We thank you for this church. We just pray blessings on everyone that's here and on this church. And, Father, Lord, we just lift up this. We pray for this offering. Uh, Lord, that hearts and lives will be changed through it. In Jesus' name, amen. Open the boxes for the first time is just, it's incredible. We are so excited. Many of the children receive the shoe boxes for the first time in their life. We pray that these boxes will be used to bring a lot of happiness and joy, but more importantly, the gospel to each part of all these little children around the world. No greater need and no greater time than right now for us to go out and serve boldly. This is what these shoe boxes are all about, to go out and to bring a hope of Jesus Christ around the world. I'm just so amazed at what God does each and every year. This is an opportunity to impact the lives of millions of children, just like you've seen. But we need more boxes for next year. Every box is an opportunity for us to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. So thank you, and God bless each and every one.
Ah, oh, good morning, Willow. What a beautiful Sunday, a break from the heat. Isn't that nice? Oh, wow. God has some good things. About six months in the Houston area. It's like from mid-October till mid-April. It's like heaven around here with the weather. So we are hitting that stretch, and that is a great and glorious blessing. Amen. All right, uh, we're going to dive right into God's Word today. Uh, if you'll turn into John chapter 17, the Gospel of John chapter 17. This is the high priestly prayer of the Lord Jesus just prior to his crucifixion. It's the most prophetic prayer in all of the Bible, most powerful prayer, I believe. And one thing we can be sure of, whatever Jesus prays, the Father's going to answer, right? So we can know what he's prayed for here. It's going to happen. So let's join him in that prayer because we're his answer. We're the answer that God's going to give. Father, thank you that You've called us to life. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly. So thank you that that's our calling to have life and how it's supposed to be, God, what you created it to be. And Lord, we know we're in a broken world and we're still broken people. But God, we also know that your son Jesus has won the victory. That he has conquered death and sin and Satan. And he has become what we are becoming. Sons and daughters of God, made in your image to bear your likeness in this world, that the world might see and believe you are good and you are God. So, Father, it is your voice we need today. I pray, Lord, that we would have ears to hear what your Spirit wants to say to Willow Church. And we would have hearts that say yes to that, Lord. We'd be good soil to receive that word, say, yes, God, in me. And you get our eyes on Jesus, who is exactly what we're supposed to be. So, God, I can't do these things. My words are not enough, but, Lord, your spirit can. And I trust you. Speak to your church. Speak to your son. Speak to your daughters. And may we hear your voice, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This morning I want to talk about four, <laughs> last week we talked about four kinds of churches, right? Today we're going, to talk about, we're going to talk about four ways that the church grows, four stages through which we grow. And it's true in every church. There are no exceptions to this. This is the way God has designed it, these four stages. And what I'm going to be talking about, it's also true in your marriage, it's true in your career, if you hear God's voice like I prayed, if we'll listen, your life, my life, we can be different today. And I mean different forever. This is powerful stuff. I'm not, I'm not kidding you. This is, this is God stuff. And if we'll listen, we're created in his image. He can do things in us that it's going to make us different forever. So let's listen to the prayer of Jesus. Last week we talked about the four kinds of churches and we said the kind, the fourth kind that God's looking for is the relational church that's filled with love. That you can have 50 people, if they know how to love God and love one another and love the broken world, that's New Testament Christianity. That's the church. Because to be filled with love is to be filled with God. God is love. So we said the real question is not do we want to learn even, this is kind of a play on words, but not do we want to learn how to be like Jesus, even though we should. The, the better question, the more, I guess, more practical question is say, do we want to learn how to love? Because that's what it means to be like Jesus. That's what it means to be like God. Do we really want to learn how to love? And that question leads us into today's, the four stages of becoming God's dwelling place, the four stages of the church through which we grow, through which we must grow. Everybody must do this. You will go through this or not go through it. You'll stop short. But they're there. This is for us. Jesus' prayer, John 17, verse 20. I do not ask on behalf of these alone. He's talking about the, the 12, his 12 followers, 11 disciples this point with Judas counted out but for those who believe in me through their word so I'm saying I'm not praying just for the ones I've got now but I'm going to pray for those who believe in me through what the apostles are preaching 
that would be us, right? We're the ones who have believed because of the words that the apostles have preached and written. Number 21, verse 21. That, here's the purpose clause, that they may all be one. So those of us who have believed the words of the apostles and the prophets and the Lord Jesus, if we believe that, here's what Jesus wants it to result in, that we may all be one. Even, what kind of oneness? How much oneness? Even as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they may also be in us. Wow. All this language of mutuality. I mean, this is the deep end of the pool. We're supposed to have oneness that looks like the oneness of the Trinity. <laughs> We are created in a Trinitarian template. In other words, the way back to Adam and Eve, when he creates them, he creates them in the image of God, male and female. We are image bearers. We are made to be the dust that bears the image of God in this world. When others want to know what God's like, they ought to be able to look at us, the church, people who belong to him. So, Jesus is praying that we would be one like they are one. That's just over our head. I'm telling you, but don't let it be over our hearts. Let our hearts say, yes, Lord, I don't get this mystery. This is deep, that we can have the kind of love and unity that exists in the Godhead. God, whatever that looks like, we want that. We want, we're, we're signed up for the whole deal, God. We're all in. And what does that result in? That, here's another purpose clause, if we can get to the unity, that the world may believe that thou didst send me. Wow. You want to be good at evangelism, Willow? You really want to reach people for Christ? We got to learn how to be one. That's how we get there. And Jesus has already said it. We talked about it last week, John 13, 35. All men will know you are my disciples if you, what? Have love for one another. Basically the same message here. If you learn how to be one like the Father, Son, and Spirit are one, then we'll have such love and unity together. What's it going to do? It's going to impact the world. Those around us, our communities, our neighborhoods, and especially in the last days as the world gets darker, as hatred grows, as lawlessness grows, as fear grows, when they look at the church and they see love and mercy and fellowship and oneness, it's like the church is so different from the rest of the world. There are going to be lots of people, and I preached on this, there's a great revival coming, and one of the things that's going to cause that revival is because we're loving one another, and the world is so tired of the hatred and the lawlessness. It's like, we want some of that love. We want some of that. The, that's the glory of God in the world, love. And so he calls us to that. So this promise of our ability to be energized by the spirit to reach the world depends upon if we become one if we learn how to love one another so verse 22 and the glory which thou hast given me i have given to them what is the glory god say jesus you've given me god you've given me glory and i've given it to them what is it here it is that the, they may be one as we are one like, that's the glory of God we can bear in this world is oneness, unity, love, fellowship. So, question, how are we going to get there, Willow? How are you going to get there? How am I going to get there? How do we actually get there? How does God make this happen? So, he's telling us our ability to reach the world is going to be contingent on whether we become the answer to this prayer. If we can become a church filled with love filled with God because God is love, then we will reach many people for Jesus Christ. In the last days, we will be a part of the revival, not the rebellion. Well, God is Trinity, three in one. I mean, he's the original small group, right? That's why churches are to have small groups. God is a small group. He is a community. He is a family. It's his nature. So when he calls us into the church, it shouldn't be surprising he calls us to be a small group. He calls us to be a family. He calls us to be in unity. It's what he is. It's how he exists. So we are to have, we talk, the Bible talks about the communion of the saints, the common union of the saints. We come together in union, in unity with one another, and that is bearing the image. That is sharing the life of God. That's being family, and that's how we reach the world. We are made in this Trinitarian pattern, get together. 
come, become one. Be filled with love. And the world is going to look on as it gets darker, and we're going to be filled with light. Remember the Isaiah 60? The world gets darker and darker. Thick darkness is over the people. But the glory of the Lord rises on you, and nations will come to your light. The glory of the Lord rises on you. What is the glory? Verse 22, the glory which you gave me, I gave to them that they may be one. There's part of it. There's a picture of it. When we become what we're supposed to be, we're going to be empowered to reach people for Jesus Christ. We're going to be a part again of the revival. The world's going to get worse and worse and better and better, faster and faster. And we are the better and better part as we become what God calls us to be. This is our calling. This is our destiny unless we become a part of those that fall away. So only two options. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I mean chapter 3, verse 10 and following. You'll see it there. Well, our problem is in our culture, especially in Western culture, we are saddled with a religion that's not sure if it really wants to be the church. Because this is the church. This is what God wants. This is what we are called to be. And it's a glorious calling. It's a good calling. It's a powerful calling to get done what we would like to do, reach other people. So in churches, we test people's commitment on the level of doctrine. Do they believe the right things like us? You know, do we, we'll test it on that. But are we, do we test it on lifestyle and character? Do we test it on love? It seems like that'd be a better metric than some of the other things we use. God wants us to be filled with love and to know how to become one. And that's true even in our own families and the church is a lot like a family and and again we come in and we have religion but a family has all kinds of things right I mean you live in your family you've got squabbles and you got this and you got that so family doesn't mean everything's always perfect that's not even what love means or nobody would be married right I mean love has its own quabbles and its own differences and you have to learn how to put all that together in something that makes life happen and that's what I want to talk about today. How are we going to make life happen? Because in, a, in our culture, especially, we live in a commodity world, and we have created commodity churches. We treat church like a filling station. We want to come to church and get our fill-up for the week, our spiritual fill-up, our information, our worship experience. It's about, I want to get that, and then I can go out in the middle of the world and make it through to the next week and go get a little more fill-up. And that's a lot of the way that we deal with church. It becomes a commodity to us. But churches are, are, are living organisms. They are something that's alive. It's about, again, life. When God calls us to Jesus, he calls us to life. Same is true with our marriages. And so God calls us to be the bride of Christ. So it's about being married. He calls us to be the family of God, learning how to be a family, brothers and sisters. That's the kind of calling we have not to treat the church as a commodity supplier where we come to get what we need, but as a family where we become God's representatives, where we become a source of love, a source of light. We're like a city set on a hill, Jesus said, and we become light as the world gets darker. There's another part of God's glory in us, that glory that's coming, the glory of the Lord rises upon you. What is it? Well, we know it's love. We also know it's light. God is light, the Bible says, right? So we get brighter, the world gets darker. People are attracted to light if they're stuck in darkness. It's like, oh, there's a way, there's some hope. Let's go toward that. That's what's going to work more and more as we move along. But there are, as we grow, as we go through this process I'm about to describe, there are very discernible shifts and stages, which I want to discuss with you, through which we must go. Hear that, you must go through these stages in order to grow up in Christ, in order to become like Jesus. Jesus himself grew up like this. He went through these stages. We all have to go through this in order to become the dwelling place of God, to become suitable as his habitation. It's like building the tabernacle in the Old Testament or the temple. Both times he, God gave them specific instructions of how, how to build it, what to make it out of, all the different sizes. And when they got it like God wanted it, what did he do? He moved in. The Spirit of God fell on it. Remember, the priest couldn't even stand to minister. It said the presence of God was so powerful in the church, in the tabernacle, I mean, in the temple. So when we get like we're all supposed to be, guess what's going to happen? Great power. There's that. This is what's going to reach the world. Power in the presence of God. But we've got to become what's inhabitable for God. 
And that's what this process does for us. So some communities get together. I mean, we could talk about, it again, all kinds of churches. They say stay together by law. It's like, you know, keep all the rules, believe all the right stuff, you know, dress right, do this right. That, that, you know, that's the formation of community. Or proximity. We all live close to this. Let's go to this. I mean, there are a lot of pe- reasons people gather together. But this church that I'm describing from God's Word is motivated out of love. It's motivated out of faith that we believe in God. We are belonging to God. It's not about, you know, trying to figure out everything just right. Not so much about how am I going to believe all the right things, even though we want to do that. It's part of the process. We work in that way. But the most important thing is to figure out who do I belong to. I belong to God. I am belonging to him. We, even our bodies, he said, you've been bought with a price. You are not your own. Our bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit. So we have to recognize, who, who do I belong to? Do I belong to me? And God says, no, not really. I created you. I saved you. I give you life and breath and everything else. According to Acts 17, that kind of covers a lot of territory. Life, breath, everything else. It's like That sounds like all of everything we have has come from God. So we've got to recognize it's all his. And when we recognize I belong to him, suddenly life can start to make sense because that's the way it is. That's just reality. You do belong to him. Whether you want to or not, you do. It's like like now you can rebel and you can not, and you're going to just keep getting in trouble. It's not going to work because it's not reality. God made us for himself. He made us for this family. And we're going to talk about, we're not going to actually talk about four stages. I'm only going to talk about three stages because I don't know any stage four community churches yet. I don't know any yet, but they're coming. And I can show them to you in the Bible, but I'm not going to because we don't have time. Like Jesus to his disciples, I have much to say, but you cannot bear it now. So (laughs) you just wouldn't be here when I was finishing up. So it wouldn't matter if I finished or not. So every, every of these stages we're going to talk about, every stage has a release of energy. It releases positive energy and it releases negative energy. And if the church is going to become what it's meant to become, you've got to realize what's the positive energy. Because you can't build on negative energy. You can't build on death. You've got to build on life. What gives life? Okay, I've got to choose that because that's what will grow. That's what will become. But if we choose, I want this, and it's death, and it's negative energy, it just keeps getting deeper and further away from what God intends to be and becomes less inhabitable for God. So every stage of community is going to have this release of energy. And we have to define and decide, where's the good energy in this stage? How do I embrace that? And if we will do that, we're going to find every time we embrace life, more power, more energy of heaven. And if we go the other way, it's drain-offs of power. It's drain-offs of life. It drags us down. It wears us out. It wearies us. It divides us. It does everything that keeps us from being what God wants us to be as Jesus prayed, that they may be one, Father, as we are one. Again, that's a mystery because that's just over our heads. I mean, that's just deep stuff. So let's be, I mean... We didn't sign up to be like students of Christianity, did we? We signed up because we needed God. Let's keep needing God because we do. Let's see reality. I need God. I need him. He's what life is all about. And I want to put this thing together so he can live here and be at home among us. Ephesians 3, uh, 2, uh, 21, 22, he says that he's building us together to become a holy temple in which God lives by his spirit. We talked about that last week. So four stages. And one thing that's hard about leadership in a church is you've got people in all different stages at the same time, or at least in the first three. I don't see much stage four ever. Occasionally I see a little bit in people, but not in a church yet. But, you know, so with leadership, it's like I've got to lead people in stage one, stage two, and stage three. It, it, it's hard. And it's hard because people are mixture. There is, though, a general place in the church where the congregation, the kind of the, the core of things, it's like you're kind of moving together. You're pretty much in the same stage. But we all will go, these, these stages I'm going to talk about, you actually go through them more than one time. 
you'll, you'll repeat this at different levels. It's like peeling an onion. You get deeper and deeper, and there, there are more levels of this, and they manifest in all different kinds of ways. But you'll get that as I talk about them. But, uh, and again, remember, think about your marriage as I'm talking about this. Think about your career. You could pour this into any way. Stage one, three stages. Stage one, initiation. Initiation. And just because it's called stage one doesn't mean it's unimportant. It's absolutely important. It's like to build a house, stage one is like you have to put in a foundation, don't you? Put in the underground and the concrete or whatever you can do. It's like that's stage one. You, you've got to have that. If you don't have that, the whole thing's going to fall sooner or later. So stage one, just because it's stage one doesn't mean it's unimportant. It's very important. We need stage one. It's, the, it's a real thing. It's a time of passion and power and favor and joy. And, and it has a sense of euphoria to it. It's like, oh, this is just wonderful. This is just awesome. But here's a, the here's a truth about stage one. You can't stay there a real long time. You can't stay in stage one a real long time. In other words, like again, building a house, if you get in the underground and the foundation, you don't want to just live on the foundation, right? After a while, even though that was essential and necessary, it's like, this is not all that fun living, living here. There are no walls, no ceiling, no air conditioning. It's like, uh, I need more than this. So stage one, absolutely essential. It's a good thing, but you can't stay. And if you try to stay there, and some churches do, oh, in fact, Honestly, a lot of churches try to stay in stage one because it's great. It's wonderful. It's life-giving. And, and, and so when stage one happens, it's, it's a really a, what's called a passive dependent stage. If I go back to my psychological days, it's like, it's like you're, you're passive. You don't really have to give anything but just kind of show up. And, and you're dependent upon the group, and it's giving you life. In other words, it's like imagine... Well, one good illustration, it's just like the first blush of romantic love. When you first fall in love, it's like, oh, it's wonderful. This is awesome. You really like being with someone, and it's fun doing things. You're discovering things. That's stage one, and that's a good thing. Who doesn't like that? It's, it's the honeymoon stage. It's like you just get married and new life and new adventure, and it's great. And, and everybody ought to have some stage ones. And if you don't, pity the person that can't have a stage one. I mean, they're just cynical and jaded about life and don't trust anything. That's a sad place to live. Stage ones are, again, they're really good things, but it's passive dependent. In other words, picture it in the church. You join a new church and it's like, I love this. This is why I didn't join because I hated it. I joined because I loved it. It's like, maybe it's the music. It's really energizing. It lifts you up in worship. Or maybe it's the preaching. I mean, this guy just, wow, I love to hear this guy <laughs> preach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amen. And, and, uh, and so maybe it's the preaching, you know, or the small group, you meet some people or, you know, the, the, the vision of the church. It's like, man, I really love this vision. It's like, there are things that are the group that it's giving to you. It's like, again, all you got to do is show up and it just comes and you love it. And you're dependent upon that for the life. There's the release of positive energy, but it's coming into you. It's not flowing out of you yet. So in one sense, we could say it's, it's selfish, and I don't mean that in a bad way. Again, it's like uh, 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 falling in love. You're, you're getting such good stuff, you know, and you just love showing up for the relationship and being there. You haven't had to sacrifice very much yet. You really haven't been tested, but you're, you're enjoying that. So life is coming to you, the worship, the preaching, the, the vision, whatever it is. It's all coming to you, and it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. So you found life. And it's blessing you. It's helping you. And you're growing because of it. And stage one has capacity for wonder and celebration and feeling good. And it's the beginning. It's the beginning of love. And remember, where are we going to be the church God wants? We have to be filled with love, the love of God. So this is the beginning of love, stage one. But it's real. It's necessary. It's the foundation. We've got to have stage one. So... The problem is, if you try to maintain stage one, we're going to just live here on the foundation. It's like, and then it gets to be miserable after a while. But churches, sometimes, because it feels so good, they want to make it always feel like that. And so, they'll run from one conference to the next, one guest speaker to the next, one big event to the It's like, let's keep the machine going. Let's go fast. Let's keep, let's turn up the music. Let's, let's do, it's like, you just want to pump up the volume. But after a while, it just it's just not real, right? I mean, it's just pumped up. And that's because 
we're not really growing in love. We're just trying to stay here in this good place. And again, I like the good place. I enjoy that. But you can't stay there forever. And that's because God wants us to grow up in love to become really deep and powerful and mature in love. And you can't just get there by stage one. You gotta have stage one. You gotta fall in love and it's a good thing. But you see, the Lord is not just out to excite us. He's out to integrate us. How many of you know it's easier to get together than stay together? Have you figured that out yet? Are you married? It's easier to get together than stay together. First choice is, I've got a you know, whole conference on teaching of, of a transformation of life. It's like first choices are magical. This stage one, they're really great. Second choices are transformational. And that's where we have to go. So we're in stage one, wonderful, awesome. Then you come to stage two, alienation. From initiation to alienation. So when we... When we make this transition, all of a sudden, it's like you'd rather stay blind than see what you start seeing in stage two. Community's broken. (laughs) Preacher preaches too long. Music's too loud. Too many this, too much that. Somebody melts the plastic spoon in the baked beans at the church picnic. It's like (laughs) stuff just stops working like it ought to work. And you're like, "Uh, this is not what I thought it was going to be. And so, and again, it happens in all different kinds of ways. Stage two, where you start to feel this alienation. It's like stuff, it's not as good as I thought it was. It's not all I hoped it would be. And now you start to see all these things that are wrong. But here's the truth. When you joined in stage one and it was wonderful and awesome and giving you life, everything you start to see in stage two, it was already there when you were in stage one. You just didn't see it. Except maybe for the plastic spoon. Maybe you didn't see that. But the rest of it, it's like you you, you don't see it, but it's already there. There, There's already stuff that was happening. You just didn't notice it because you're so in love. I mean, one of the things the Bible says about love, love covers a multitude of sins. When you've got this fresh love going, you just overlook stuff, right? And that's a good thing because love just carries us over the top. And so this is where we land in stage two. Now all of a sudden we start to see how broken things are that we, we didn't see in stage one. And there's a truth here that I hope we can get, and that is this. With you as a child of God, when God loved you in Christ and he saved you, and then you feel so good. Again, here's that stage one. God's loving you. You feel forgiven. You feel lighter. The world feels good. And you go down for a little while in stage one, and then you start to say, I've got some bad spots in me still. I'm not like Jesus. i got some... Addictions. I've got some compulsions. I've got some attitudes. It's like, I'm not there yet. Now listen, here, here's, the, here's the great power of this. When God saved you to begin with and you hit stage one, he already knows that stuff about you you start to see in stage two. He already knew you were messed up. He's not surprised by it at all. That's why the Bible says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He came, he knows all the stuff, and you get saved, and you feel like, oh, I'm saved, it's all done. And it's like, oh, it's not all done. But God's like, I knew that when I called you. I know that when I died for you. You messed up, (laughs) right? It's like, you're broken, but I love you. I picked you out while you were still broken. But how you go through stage two, you have to start to see the truth. In fact, one of the things in the last days, says in Thessalonians, says people did not love the truth so as to be saved. It's like they didn't want to face the truth. They didn't want to look at it square in the face. They, it's like, no, I don't want to see that. And they don't get saved because of it. You've got to face, what's reality? Truth is reality. Well, this is reality. We're already broken, but God loved us anyway. God chose us anyway. Jesus died for us anyway. I mean, bottom line is the truth will set you free, but first it will make you miserable, right? So now you start seeing the truth in stage two about yourself. I got saved. I feel so good. Now I feel miserable. God loved me, and I'm still a mess. And so here we are in that misery. And so stage two, it's the desert. It's the dark night of the soul. It's the time of temptation. And what happens in stage two, a lot of times people leave. 
They get divorced in marriage. This thing is messed up. This person's not what I thought. Well, they were already that. You just didn't see it before. They were that way when you married them. With stage one, you overlook, you don't see. Stage two, you start to see alienation. So people, I'm getting divorced. I'm changing churches. I'm going to another school. I don't like these friends. I, it's like we just leave and start over. We go looking for another stage one. And we get the new stage one, and it's awesome, and it's wonderful. And congratulations, and hallelujah. And then you get into stage two. I don't like this either. <laughs> we keep looking for this perfect platform to invest ourselves in, or this perfect person that we can invest ourselves in. And as you go through that, you recognize, you know what? This thing is broken. And there are a lot of problems that start to arise. You start to see them. Some of them are rational problems. I mean, in other words, just because you get in stage two, I mean, some of those problems ought to be solved. The real problem is like, yeah, we ought to work on this. And you can. You can work on some of the stuff. It's not like everything you see in stage two you now try to ignore. No, you have to feel your feelings. You have to say, this is what I feel. This is what I think. This is where I am. This is what's disappointing to me. This is what doesn't sit. This is what I'm not liking now. Pastor, could you please not preach so long? It's like you got to start getting that stuff and recognize okay this is what I'm feeling don't don't deny your feelings you start stuffing it down inside it's gonna hurt you or someone else at some point you feel your feelings so I'm not asking you in stage two to ignore the bad stuff some of the stuff you can say hey can we fix this you talk about it you get it in the light in the light is where love happens where truth happens where things can be fixed but not everything can be fixed because some of the stuff is not really like wrong stuff. Some of it is just, and I've preached on this, different preferences. Some people like longer sermons. Some people like shorter sermons. Some people like louder music. Some people like softer music. Some people like this. Some people like that. And it's not that one's right or wrong. It's just we have different preferences. We're humans. And it's okay to have a preference. But you can't solve all of those when you put them together in a family. Everybody's not going to get their way every time. It doesn't, it's just not life. It can't happen. Whether it's marriage, whether it's church, whether it's your career, it's like there are going to be parts of your job that just stink. And you got to say, you know what? If they'd let me be in charge, I could fix this, but you're not in charge. <laughs> My wife and I make the comment often why are we not in charge of the world? We could fix this, but we're not, so it can't be fixed. It's like some things you have to let go of, even though you see a way it could be fixed. The truth is, it's not your place to fix it. You wish it was, but it's not. And what are we going to do? We can leave and go try to find another stage one, and you can do that a whole bunch. And one of the big problems with church in America, Christianity in America, is the large number of stage one, stage two people that never get to stage three. Wow. So it's not easy, this growth stuff, because we're talking about growing up to be like God. That's a pretty big task, don't you think? To be love. God is love, to be filled with love. It's a pretty big task that we have ahead of us, and it's not easy. That's why Jesus died. Well, so we get into stage two, and we get disillusioned. But here's the truth. You can't get disillusioned unless you had illusion to start with, right? <laughs> What you saw in stage one was really an illusion. I mean, there's a lot of good stuff, but you just didn't see all the other stuff that you didn't like before. Now you see it. And you really need, when you get to stage two, here's a couple of things you need. You need to find a stage three person that you trust that can say to you, I know, I know it's messed up. I know, I know, I know, I've been there. But come on, God's got something good down the road. Just stick with it. Stay with me. I love you. We'll be friends. Let's walk through this thing. And again, honest, open, in the light. That's the way it has to be lived. A stage three person will help you greatly. Find a stage three friend. Because in stage two, before you get to stage three, you've got to let go of control. Oh, I always tell my wife, honey, we can cast that control spirit off of you. She said, I like it. I, I don't want to get rid of it. You know, she's not here. Hope she doesn't watch this online. I'll be in, I'll be in serious trouble. Just teasing. It's like, we like some of our broken stuff, right? <laughs> we don't want to get rid of some of it. It's like, I'm real at home with this, you know. 
But it's, an, it's a rational journal, journey. Some of it can be fixed. But it's also an emotional journey. You just don't like some stuff. Or you're mad at stuff. Or you're wounded. Someone hurt you. Someone wounded you. I'll tell you the truth. In our new member class at our church in Houston, we teach them these four stages. I've got a one-page summary of the whole thing right here. Four stages of community life. And we tell them up front, hey, welcome to Calvary. We're going to wound you. <laughs> We're going to hurt you. We're going to disappoint you. We're going to do something that you don't like and don't deserve. We don't want to do that. We don't mean to do that. But that's how we have to grow up. We've got to learn how to deal with the pain. You've got to because the world has fallen. We live in a fallen world. We've got to learn how to deal with it. And it's going to take increasing trust of our leaders who we know love us, even though we might disagree with them about something. You'll never agree with anybody about everything. Not your marriage, not your work, not your church. Decreasing control. I, I can't control all this. Maybe I can help fix a few things, but I can't control all of it. I've got to let go of that desire to control. And I've got to make a greater surrender. You see, part of our problem is we have this false idealism. In stage one, oh man, this is, this is what I've been, this is heaven. We think stage one, stage four, because it feels so good. But it's not. It's, 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 that's deceiving us. But we think it's so great, and, and, but we get this false idealism. We love, oh, this is what church is meant to be, and then we start to see the stuff wrong. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said it so powerfully. He who loves the church will destroy the church. He who loves the brethren will build the church. Think about that. He who loves the church, the ideal it's like, that has really been a struggle for me. It's like, I see in the scripture the ideal. I see stage four. And it's like, ah. But if I love that so much, I can't love the broken people around me, then the ideal is going to end up destroying me and the work I'm trying to do. Because we're not the ideal yet. Only Jesus is the ideal so far. We're moving that way, but we're not there yet. If you just want the ideal, you're going to destroy whatever it is you think you love because we've got to love the broken people in the midst of the process. And here's where stage two gets to stage three. We let go of our idealism and we face the problem and we decide, you know what? The church is broken. Or my husband, my wife, they're broken. But we decide this. Here's how you get to stage three. Here's how we really get going in love and God can move in in big fashion. You say to yourself, you know, I'm still broken when Jesus died for me. And I'm still broken, but he still loves me. I've got to take the love he gives to me as a broken person. And now I've got to love this broken person in my life. I've got to love this broken church God called me to. I've got to love them where they are, not like I want them to be. Again, you can work on some of the want to, but not all of it. Love is what we have to learn here. I'm broken, but God loves me. Now, I've got to learn to love the broken things that God's put around me. You know what that does? Makes you like God. <laughs> That's what he does. For you, we have to pass that on. And then we become a thoroughfare of God into this world. And God begins to change things in us, first of all, and around us. Because love, it just does so many powerful things. So, God... God will see to it that you go through stage two. He will see to it. You've got to learn how to love some broken things because that's how I'm loving you. And I want you to learn to love others like I'm loving you. And you're broken. That's what God's saying. But I love you totally, completely. Now I want you to pass that on to your broken spouse, to your broken friend, to your broken church. Pass that love on. And then you're going to see me move in in new ways because he's, he's love. Listen. Here's the truth I learned a long time ago. If God fixes a fix to fix you and you fix the fix before you're fixed, he'll fix another fix to fix you. <laughs> you want me to say that again? <laughs> if God fixes a fix to fix you and you fix the fix before you're fixed, he'll fix another fix to fix you. You can read it in the Bible, Isaiah 50, 10 and 11. If you don't believe me, Isaiah 50, 10 and 11. I don't have time, but just read Isaiah 50, 10 and 11. That's what it says. I'm just giving you the Meek's modern translation. (laughs) 
Say it another way, you don't flunk God's test. You just keep taking them till you pass. Right? He wants us to go on into stage three. He wants us to learn how to love broken things. That's stage three, learning to love as God loves. So stage three, we see stage one, initiation. Stage two, alienation. Stage three, transformation. We begin to be transformed. Wow, it's a powerful thing. Learning to love like God loves. This is adult Christianity. This is maturing. Growth and resistance require each other. Like, again, bench pressing a barbell. It's the weights that you're having to struggle against that are doing you good. And when you have to push against broken things with love, it does you good. It makes you more filled with love. It makes more room for love in your life. That's, this is loving in the light which is where God wants us, right? Walk in the light as he is in the light. The blood of Jesus cleanses you from all sin and you have fellowship with one another. If we refuse to walk in the light, we're not going to get there. We're fooling ourselves. We've got to be in the light. We've got to, stage three is a response to a call. God, I've either got to leave or recognize I'm broken too and you still love me. Now I got to pass that on. I got to start doing what you do. Because that's the image I'm made in. This is the way I was formed. And how you start to become who you really are. And it's scary because it doesn't seem that way, does it? To our flesh, to our natural man. But the things of the, foolish, the, things of the spirit are foolish to the natural man. You think, but I'm giving up the ideal. But I've got to love that mess. I got, uh, but you know, it seems foolish to the flesh. But to the spirit, it's transformational. It makes the temple ready for God to move in and have more space, and to have more influence in and through your life. Stage three is the response to the call, as Jesus said, as the Father sent me, even so send I you. You say, God, you sent me here. I'm going to love. I'm going to pass on your love. This is what God does in us to make us what we're supposed to to be that's where the energy of life comes from the energy of death is i'll just go somewhere else i'll just start over i'll just become cynical whatever it is that's all death you can't build on that but the energy of life is i'm broken they're broken i'm going to love them anyway because that's how god treats me i just got to treat others like that that's where it all happens jesus came and he did what he laid down his life for sinners isn't that what jesus did and that's exactly what we don't want to do, right? I don't want to lay down my life for sin. Again, we want this perfect platform, this perfect marriage, this perfect church, this perfect career. And none of them are because the world is fallen. We've got to learn how to lift it up. And the only power that can do that is love. Yes, there's some practical things we can fix along the way. Again, I'm not saying don't try to do that i'm not saying suppress your feelings i'm saying work on what you can work on but learn it's going to take a lot of letting go and loving what's broken and knowing it's not going to be fixed at least not for now but i'm going to love it because love is what can fix us it's what can transform us greater than any other thing that we can possibly do we begin to decide for what god has already decided for he loves the church he loves the family that he's building, even though it's broken at this current time. When we get here to stage three and we start taking the love God gives to us and giving it away, then we stop treating the church like a commodity and a filling station and we start living in it like a family. This is my family. Yeah, I got some brothers and sisters that are a little wonky, but I love them. God love them. You know? You got to, if you don't learn to do that, you're never going to get to stage three. You got to love broken things like God loves you as a broken thing. Pass it on. Community now becomes family. The church becomes a family. We move from self actualization, which is our goal stage one, stage two. How do I actualize myself? How do I become and have what I want to become and what I want to have? Again, that's not a bad thing. But we, in stage three, you move from self-actualization to self-surrender. And that's where Jesus lived, wasn't it? He laid down his life. Love will lay down its life. Oh, it's a powerful thing. 
We just got to believe God can do something when we let go more than when we try to control and fix. When we love, it's a greater power. Trust me, believe me, it is a great power. There's no greater power in this world than to learn how to love. One of the greatest plights in our culture, the number of stage one and stage two people we have because we have a commodity church. We've got to start having some stage three churches. And when I start talking about stage four, it will blow your mind. And we're going to get there. Just like Abraham and Sarah, 100 years old, they had a baby. God's got some miracles in store for us in the last days. There are going to be some transformation in churches we hadn't dreamed of yet. Well, I hope some of this light, biblical light, will help us see our marriages, our work, our church with the eyes of God. It takes love. Amen? Father, may we be what you are, love. May we find life that Jesus came to give abundant and full. But Lord, help me remember the way he got there was by sacrifice and surrender, by trusting you completely. God, help us to trust you with the process and not just to demand your conclusion that everything become fixed. Help us to know if we want to be a part of that, then we have to get filled with love and filled with you. We have to be a temple flooded with the presence of God and divine light. And God, we can be. This church can be. God, I am looking forward to Willow being a bright light as this world gets darker. And people will flood to this place looking for love, looking for hope, looking for light in darkness. God, keep us moving down this pathway. Would you stand with me? Ministry teams, would you come? We'll have some teams here available to pray for you as we dismiss. Again, you're welcome to come just to sit at the altar, spend a few minutes with God. Time to make some self-surrenders. Say, God, I just need to make a fresh start with you and say, Lord, I see it. I hear what you're saying to me. Because, again, remember my prayer when I started. If you're just hearing Pastor Steve and not hearing the voice of God in this, we're diminishing what's happening here. This is God's word for this moment, for this hour, for this season, for us as a church family at Willow. Let's receive God's word. Let's be good soil. Let it grow. Yeah, it's scary. It's painful to die to ourselves. But it is powerful when we are filled with God. I want that for you. Oh, I want that for you. I want that for your marriage. I want that for your church fellowship family. I want that with your kids and your parents. Lord, God, you have such good things you want to create, and we just don't know how fallen it all is. God, fill us with the power that can lift it up. Fill us with the power of love. If you have other needs, please feel free to come for prayer also. If you need healing, something else you're struggling with, we just believe in prayer. God says, you know, prayer honors me, and he will honor prayer. You come and receive. Let God minister to you too. But let's all go away as good soil for this seed of God's word and God's truth. Let us love the truth so as to be saved. Amen. It's a short business meeting after church for just a few minutes. And tonight, we're going to have an encounter with God service. The Lord's given me some things for this evening. I'm going to share, and we're going to minister tonight. I hope you'll be back. What time does it start? Six o'clock. Six, six, six to eight. All right, six o'clock. Be here. We're going to meet with God and minister and see the power and presence of the Lord with us. Amen. 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 God bless you. You are dismissed. Come for prayer. If you need prayer, please do that. If you're a first-time guest, we have some, a gift card for you out in the, out in the foyer, the atrium. Uh, please swing by and pick that up. Passion, so to let it happen.